All right, so where are we now and how did we get here, right? So here's a screenshot that I pulled from um, Johns Hopkins. They've been doing this coronavirus tracker map um, for since the beginning pretty much of the pandemic. And we can see that there are quite, you know, a few cases over 3.4 million deaths. And I pulled this you know, yesterday at, at 3.30ish. Um, but a bright spot is that there have been a ton of vaccine doses, as you can see in the, the green numbers given out. And so they've recently started tracking that. And so that is a great, great metric. Um, so how did we get here? Well, public health is kind of chronically underfunded, particularly in the US, but globally as well. Um, it doesn't really matter what political party is in charge or anything like that. It doesn't get very much attention. Um, and we were not very prepared for this pandemic, despite you know relatively recently experiencing a pandemic the H1N1 swine flu back in 2009. Um, and, you know, we throw money at the problem when there is a problem, but then as soon as the problem is gone, uh, the support disappears. Um, and part of that is when public health works, nothing happens, right? You live a long, healthy life. It's very uneventful. And so nobody wants to spend money on it because when it's working, um, you know, nothing looks bad. Um, and so we have to keep in mind that even when this pandemic is over and we're on to the next challenge, that we need to keep spending money and being prepared because, um, because it, it is a problem. So infectious diseases are an integral part of human history. They have been for, for, for millennia. Uh, centuries. Um, here are some of the bigger pandemics that we've seen, um, you know, starting with the bubonic plague. Um, and then kind of recently we have the HIV uh, AIDS pandemic, uh, the, the H1N1 swine flu in 2009, Ebola epidemic in 2014, and now COVID-19, which we'll all remember for a long time. So how does COVID-19 compare to some other diseases? Well, we're still in the midst of the HIV epidemic. Um, it's been going on for over 40 years. Uh, here we're looking at cases and deaths um, just in 2018. Um, there have probably been about 35 million HIV deaths since the pandemic began um, in the 1980s and 1990s. So, um, and we haven't really made much progress, right? There's no vaccine with the HIV AIDS, um, despite 30 years of trying to come up with one. And so we're still, still working on that one. Um, but, you know, there's, there were only, you know, 770,000 deaths in one year from HIV. Um, and that number is, goes down um, from when the uh, pandemic first started as we're getting better and better at turning HIV into a chronic disease instead of a, a death sentence very shortly. So people are living longer with HIV. Some of the other ones I mentioned, the 2014 Ebola epidemic, right? So that was the largest Ebola epidemic we'd seen. Um, before then, there maybe were 100 cases, 150 cases, very small isolated outbreaks. And then we had this multi-country uh, epidemic um, in 2014. We do have a vaccine that's in, in, in rolling out in parts of Africa right now. So that was great development, moved quickly. Of course, we didn't develop the vaccine despite knowing about Ebola for decades since the 1970s. We didn't develop the vaccine until we had a huge outbreak that could have threatened to come you know, into Europe and the United States. And then we also had the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, um, which while the pandemic is over, that flu uh, still circulates, right? So that's one of the main causes of flu every year. It's still the strain, one of the strains in the flu vaccine. And so while we may think of that pandemic as over, that flu has just become part of our everyday lives. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about the vaccine, right? And so the vaccines, multiple vaccines for COVID um, are really a big reason why we are where we are, right? So in the United States, cases are plummeting, hospitalizations from COVID are plummeting, deaths are plummeting, um, largely because of the rollout of this vaccine. Now we're not seeing quite as much rollout all over the world. That's definitely um, inequity and in access to the vaccines. So as we all probably know, India and Nepal are experiencing huge surges in cases and deaths. Their, their um, health systems are completely overwhelmed. But we're also seeing huge outbreaks in um, South America. And so it's really a great technical feat um, that we were able to develop this vaccine so quickly. Um, and some of the reasons are is because we were able to cut down on some of the steps and overlap steps. So the top line here is looking at kind of the traditional pathway for vaccine development. Um, and then this lower pathway is how, you know, it still went through all the steps needed or all the different vaccine candidates went through all the steps needed to develop a vaccine. We were just able to overlap some of the steps as well as um, get through committees, not have to wait um, for different committees to be ready. They, they prioritized reviewing this evidence quickly. Um, and so we're not doing a very good job of getting the vaccine out equitably all over the world. And so we are a global community. We definitely need to get the vaccine to everyone because as long as there's COVID somewhere in the world, we're at risk. And so we keep hearing about reaching you know, herd immunity. Um, and so that is for the entire population. And so if children can't be vaccinated, we need all the adults to be vaccinated. So it's not you know, 80% of eligible people who can be vaccinated, it's 80% of the entire population. And so we really need all adults to be vaccinated to move on to, to this developing this herd immunity or thinking about the future without COVID. And so I kind of want to talk about, you know, is eradication of COVID-19 a possibility? So does anybody know um, which two diseases humans have um, purposefully eradicated. Anybody know? One's kind of a, a hint. Polio and smallpox. Smallpox is right. Polio not is not. We have not quite eradicated polio yet. Anybody know what the other one is? It's rinderpest, which is actually a cattle disease. So those are the only two diseases that humans have purposefully um, eradicated and gone through um, and made a, a, a concerted effort to eradicate. So what does eradication mean, right? So eradication, when we talk about infectious diseases, is complete elimination of an infectious disease from the entire globe. And so often we'll talk about elimination and so polio has been eliminated from the United States. And so that would be no local transmission of an infectious disease within a specifically uh, defined geographic area. And so you kind of go through elimination at the local levels or larger levels, country, region of the globe, and then hope to get to eradication. So why would we want to pursue eradication, right? So once something's eradicated, you don't need to continue to control it. Uh, so you can stop making vaccines, stop doing uh, testing for that disease, right? So like with smallpox, anyone born after 1950 in the United States didn't routinely get a smallpox vaccine, you know, depending on your career, things like that, maybe you got one. Um, and then we don't really give smallpox vaccine except for military or some things like that now hasn't been given. Um, and so then you continue to save that money. However, to get to eradication, it costs a lot and it's really intensive. You need rigorous control and surveillance. And that's most important when you're close to eradication. So like with polio, we're very close to eradication, but every time there's a small setback, and we lower our guard a little bit, stop spending so much money on the eradication efforts, then it comes back. And so, especially when you're at really low 
um, incidence rate, then it's really hard to keep trying to spend that money. And so it's really intensive and not all diseases can actually be eradicated. So we'll talk about characteristics of disease that need, that need to be occurring in order for something to be eradicated. So there are several ongoing um, eradication efforts currently. Um, so polio, as we've mentioned, is ongoing. We're close, right? In 2017, there were only 22 cases, um, but we're not quite there yet. Those numbers have gone up a little bit since 2017. Um, the COVID lockdowns did not help the eradication of polio, but that's what, that's what happens. Uh, another one is guinea worm. We're also getting really close to eradicating guinea worm. Yaws is another one. And we're also working towards eradicating malaria. That's gonna be much more difficult because it's transmitted through a mosquito. So we have that whole other cycle involved. Um, but to explore if COVID-19 is eradicable, I'm going to talk a little bit about smallpox and why the smallpox eradication program worked and what was successful about it. All right, so the problem of smallpox, it's pervasive throughout human history. We can see it in literature and it was hugely influential on uh, human historical events. All right, so really high case fatality rate, 30 to 35%. And in the people that survived, there was usually pretty extensive facial scarring, killed about 400,000 Europeans, just Europeans, right? We're not we're not talking about globally, right? Uh, every year in the 18th century. So a huge problem. So one of the things that some people noticed, right, is that milk maidens who developed cowpox seemed much less likely to develop smallpox, right? And so this concept is actually pretty familiar to us when we think about terms like they, their skin was as beautiful and as smooth as a milkmaid, right? It's because they got smallpox or they got cowpox and didn't get smallpox with that facial scarring. So right in Joffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, they talk about how beautiful and lovely the skin of the milkmaid was. And this was why, because they got cowpox. And so cowpox is a similar virus to smallpox, but it doesn't cause those symptoms. It just causes some of these, you know, pustules on the hands or wherever the contact with that virus was made. And then they don't get sick. They don't get very sick. They usually clears up on their own and then they're healthy. And so somebody noticed this, people noticed this and decided to, to try something. So they came up with this hypothesis that cowpox somehow protects people from smallpox and decided to try to test that. So Edward Jenner is largely given credit for coming up with this idea, although there were probably several people simultaneously and a similar concept to this had been used for centuries in Asia, um, but Edward Jenner gets, uh, gets credit for it. So what he did in, in 1796 is he purposefully inoculated eight-year-old James Phipps with material from the pustule from the milkmaid, Sarah Nelms, who had gotten cowpox from a cow named Blossom. And so this is what he put in his scientific report. He recorded all this information. And so he purposely exposed uh, James Phipps to this cowpox pustule. Um, and so this is actually where the word vaccine comes from. So the Latin word for cow is vaca, and so vaccine, and that's where we get this term from these experiments in 1796. So then he purposely exposed James Phipps to smallpox after he got was given the cowpox and James Phipps remained well. And then he did report that they repeated this process on a number of children. So we know the cow's name, but we don't know how many people he actually tried this on. Um, so when we think about the clinical trial process for vaccines today and the clinical trial process of this smallpox vaccine, right, there is definitely some problems. Uh, no control group, we probably only on a few people, right? He also did what's called a challenge trial where he purposely exposed James Phipps to smallpox. And we can do challenge trials today 
but they need to be very well regulated and monitored. And we probably wouldn't do a challenge trial with something that has a 30% case fatality rate. Um, there would need to be a lot more regulation. And so um, there are definitely some problems with this clinical trial, but luckily for James Phipps and Edward Jenner, it, it worked quite well. Um, and so the rest is history, right? It was published in 1797. And by 1800, it was uh, published in all major European languages. And then in 1804, it was brought all over the, the Spanish empire. And so this is how we have um, vaccines now. All right, so what makes a disease eradicable? Not all infectious diseases can be eradicated. So the first thing is that we need no chronic infectious state. So we think about HIV, hepatitis B, their chronic infections um, probably can't eradicate them. We need no significant non-human reservoir. So we think about tetanus, right? That's in the soil. It's going to be impossible to eradicate because there's always, you know, more things coming in, more potential exposure, or, you know, if it has a, a reservoir and other animals that humans are frequently exposed to. There needs to be a single genetically stable pathogen, right? So influenza is changing all the time and so really difficult to eradicate influenza. We need an accurate diagnosis, right? You need to know what it is. A lot of things cause fever. So, you know, you can't just look at symptoms. You need to be able to know when something is the disease and when something is not the disease. We need a highly effective intervention. Usually we think of a vaccine, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a vaccine. And then finally, we need societal support and political will, right? Again, the, especially the last stage of eradication takes a lot of work and a lot of human resources, a lot of monetary resources, and we need to be supportive of this all the way through to eradication. So here are some features of smallpox that made it very um, a, a good candidate to eradicate, right? So only reservoir is humans, relatively low transmissibility, very few subclinical cases, a long incubation period, very big public, public um, problem, a good vaccine, very, very uh, efficacious, caused a lot of side effects, but a very efficacious vaccine that could be administered pretty easily. And there was a uh, pretty striking seasonality. So the WHO decided that they did want to eradicate smallpox in 1967. And at that time, there were 10 to 15 million cases every year. So quite a few cases. Um, so they had to develop a uniform smallpox vaccine. So there were a lot of kind of different versions of the cowpox uh, going around. And so they had to make it uniformly and then provide a widespread distribution of this vaccine to particularly countries where there was a lot of transmission, which tend to be lower and middle income countries. And then active case surveillance. So luckily smallpox has a pretty unique presentation. There are other pox illnesses, but this one's pretty unique. And so we could figure out, you know, based on self-report what kind of cases there were. So we use this active surveillance to find cases and then um, uh, vaccinate people all around them. So one of the major reasons that we were able to do this was this development of a freeze-dried heat-stable vaccine, right? And this is so important because we didn't need a cold chain. So we think about the, the Pfizer vaccine, which needs to be at negative 80 degrees Celsius, right? That is just not practical uh, in some places. And so this was actually a vaccine that could just be carried around at room temperature, didn't need a fridge at all. And the next thing was the development of this bifurcated needle which is basically like a normal textile needle, but they put a little groove in the middle. And so this actually needle can be sterilized and reused. Um, unlike the hollow syringes that we use for most vaccines now, we can't reuse them because you can't sterilize the inside of those, of those syringes. And so these two developments were huge in being able to eradicate smallpox. 
And so they implemented this search and containment vaccination strategy. So Bill Faggy, um, who was a, one of the lead epidemiologists, was a firefighter. And this is where he got this idea um, for this kind of ring vaccination. So you don't need to vaccinate everyone in the entire world. If you got smallpox from a person, you got, you got smallpox from a person. So we could find a case and just vaccinate rings around them. Like when there's a fire, right? You don't need to preventatively put water on all the houses around it. You just put water on the houses next to it um, to contain it. And so he came up with this strategy and would actually look for active cases and then isolate the patients and vaccinate in rings around them, starting with the house, then to the neighbors, and then to the rest of the village. And another good thing about smallpox is that you could actually give the vaccine after exposure and it would prevent you from getting sick and passing it on to other people. And so this post-exposure um, work, the way the vaccine would work post exposure was also really helpful. And so the last naturally occurring case of smallpox was in Somalia in 1977. The smallpox was declared eradicated in 1979 and the smallpox vaccination was discontinued in 1980, except for, you know, special cases. Only two known labs have smallpox specimens. So that's the CDC and a lab in Russia. And we don't give smallpox vaccine. We don't have very much smallpox vaccine anymore because there is no smallpox. So now that I've given kind of this little history, we'll talk about some of my predictions for COVID-19. And, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. These are kind of my guesses. Um, so we'll see in a year how close I am or in a few years how close I am. So can smallpox or uh, can COVID be eradicated? Well, let's see. Um, there is no chronic infectious state that we've seen, so that's great. Um, there doesn't seem at this point to be a significant non-human reservoir. It seems to be pretty much transmitted human to humans. We need a single genetically stable pathogen. So that's, you know, that's hard to say, right? We keep hearing about all these variants. Right now, it looks like the part of the vaccine um, or part of the pathogen that's in the vaccine, right, is still pretty stable, um, hasn't changed too much. So I, I think, okay, we're, 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 we're okay right now, but we'll definitely have to keep watching um, to see if it still remains genetically stable. So these RNA viruses are very fickle, they change a lot. And so it's not quite as bad as the flu, but we'll need to keep watching. We do have accurate diagnostics now. Um, we do have highly effective interventions like the vaccines. They're very safe and effective. They're low cost right now, right? They're free right now. Feasibility, right? We're definitely at a problem scaling up. We need a cold chain. We need to be able to keep that vaccine cold, right? Until it's about ready to go into people's arms. So it's not quite as feasible as we need to, but I think, you know, we have the, we have the, the tools. The next one is, right, that societal support and political will, right? So those are very tricky and those are the things that change quickly, right? And so we need to, you know, keep going. And then when we think about, you know, funding for contact tracing, isolation, the vac keeping the vaccine going, right? That is that we got to make sure we keep going, keep those going if we actually want to eradicate COVID. Um, and then we have, you know, vaccine skepticism, which are, are, is a problem, right? That is societal support and political will could be a problem, right? So vaccine skepticism is nothing new. Here we have a uh, political cartoon from I think 1801, right? And so shortly after the smallpox vaccine came out, right? And here we have all these people sprouting cows from different body parts. Right, so vaccine skepticism has been around as long as vaccines, and it is one of the biggest threats to the control of COVID right now. So um, we're not gonna be able to eliminate or eradicate COVID while there is vaccine hesitancy, skepticism, and refusal. And so we need to make sure that we address people who are skeptic of the vaccine and figure out their concerns so that we can get as many people vaccinated as possible. 
Will there be seasonality? Um, I personally think there will be. So there are other coronaviruses that infect humans. Uh, they're one of the causes of the common cold. And we see pretty striking seasonality of all these other coronaviruses. Um, so if eradication does occur for COVID, um, it probably won't be for years, probably more like decades. And so in the meantime, I think we're gonna see some pretty striking seasonality. Most summers are gonna look great. And then in the fall and winter, kind of in conjunction with the flu season, I think we're gonna start seeing, seeing cases pop up again. And so how big these peaks are, right? That depends on how much herd immunity is, right? How much immunity is in your community? Will we need booster doses or new vaccines because of these variants, right? So all the vaccines currently target the spike protein. And here we're seeing a, a huge 3D rendition of what that spike protein looks like. Um, and so this is where the, the spike protein is where coronaviruses get their name in the first electron micrographs that they saw that this, the spike around the outside uh, made it look like the virus had a halo. Um, and so crown, corona, that's kind of where that comes from. Um, however, and so all the vaccine candidates currently target this spike on the outside, um, but this spike changes quickly. Um, so the first thing vaccine companies do when they hear about a variant is they look to see how, if that variant has changed its spike protein, right? And so if that spike protein is still similar enough, our bodies will still respond to it if you got the vaccine. And so right now, um, all the variants seem to be, have very similar spike proteins. The vaccines seem to be working quite well against all the variants that we found. But as things keep changing, we have to keep monitoring this situation. Um, and so you just, and then, but if we do see a, a variant that the spike protein is different enough that it'll escape our immune system, Luckily with these technologies, both the mRNA vaccines and the adenovirus vector vaccines, you can just change the sequence in the, in the vaccine. And now you have a new vaccine that would be tailor-made to target the new spike protein. So we'd be able to make new or modified vaccines pretty quickly to, to identify variants um, if needed. So the other question then is waning immunity, right? So if the virus changes and we have a variant, right? The vaccine still works, right? It's just the virus is different now. The question of waning immunity, right? So it's the same virus, same spike protein, but your immune system doesn't respond. And so will we need booster doses of the same vaccine? Um, and so we really don't know yet. The way we figure that out is we follow people for a really long time. And so we haven't had time to follow people yet because the virus is so new. Um, so I think personally that we will need booster doses. The question, because there will be waning immunity, the question is how frequently. Um, I don't know if we'll need a, a booster dose every year, but we'll probably need one every few years, assuming there aren't variants that are completely different. And if it's kind of like the flu that changes um, every year, then maybe we'll need a, a new vaccine, a booster every year with a new variant in, it, in the vaccine to protect us from the most uh, common circulating one. And so I've talked about herd immunity. And so I heard somebody on NPR and I, I forgot who talking about, he doesn't like to call it herd immunity. He likes to call it community immunity because what matters is your community, your local community. So here's a picture. It's actually looking at measles vaccination but the same concept kind of applies. So if you look at row C here and look at the different colors, right? So in yellow, that means 80% of the people aren't vaccinated. Um, but when you look at the far, uh, the far right box here, where it's all kind of that light blue, it looks like that big geographic area, that county actually has pretty good coverage. But when you start getting down to smaller and smaller units, you can see that there are pockets of people who are where a large proportion of people are not immune. And so those pockets are what are really dangerous. So if the, the few people who aren't vaccinated are kind of spread out evenly in the community, then they're protected. 
But if they're in a pocket and all together and people who are unvaccinated tend to clump together, right, then that's dangerous. That's where the coronavirus is going to go. That's where it's going to replicate. And that's where those seasonal spikes are going to come from or those pockets of unvaccinated people. And so your community and your community immunity is what matters. So the risk for infectious disease and transmission is always local. And so thinking about who the people are around you and what their immunities are really matters. Just, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that I've been working on this year, which is wastewater surveillance for COVID. Um, and so we've been using wastewater to monitor trends in COVID transmission. And so using wastewater for disease surveillance is not new. Um, it got, it's been used for, for decades. It gained a, a popularity during the polio eradication campaign. So um, polio, we think of most severe symptoms, paralysis, right? You think of the children in the iron lungs, right? Those symptoms only happen in about one out of every 200 cases. So by the time you see a case of paralysis in a health center from polio, <clears throat> polio has been circulating in that community. You've had hundreds of cases before you see uh, really bad polio symptoms. And so what they started doing is this looking at for polio in the wastewater. And so they would uh, test the sewer water, um, look at if there's, uh, and then see if they could find the polio virus in the wastewater. And so actually when they have found it, they're able to go in and immunize the entire community and, and prevent any cases of polio related paralysis. And so really we've only, epidemiologists have only been using wastewater surveillance to monitor fecally orally transmitted pathogens. So polio is, uh, you know, infects the intestines. Um, and so it's a fecal oral pathogen. And that's what we were looking for in wastewater. And so with COVID, we really changed that paradigm to actually be able to use wastewater to monitor for a respiratory pathogen, which we didn't really think was possible, but multiple people have done this throughout the world. Um, different people are implementing different strategies. And we've been doing it here, um, myself, along with a bunch of people um, at SU, Upstate, and SUNY ESF. So why would we want to use wastewater surveillance? Well, it's really representative of the population, right? You don't need to be able to have access to the health system to get a test. Um, you can monitor the entire population. Anyone who's connected to the sewer system, you'll get a, a sample from them and can see what's going on. There's no identifiable information, right? It's very private, very secure um, because everyone's mixed together in the, in the sewage system. You don't need to have diagnostic capability um, for individual cases. We also don't need to depend on people going to the doctor, right? So different people have different health seeking behavior and until you go to the doctor, right? We won't know necessarily what's going on. We don't need to have symptomatic cases in order to find coronavirus in the wastewater. And it's very cost effective, right? You do one test and now you've tested the entire community instead of you know, hundreds of thousands of tests to test the entire community. So here are the COVID-19 cases um, in New York State through in early 2020. So in our first picture we have in March, right, March 15th of 2020, and that's pretty much when we shut down the entire state, right, because of transmission in New York City, right? We all know that it was really bad in New York City, but there wasn't very much transmission throughout the rest of the state, right? Because as I said before, transmission is local. And so we have these huge statewide restrictions, even though there probably wasn't very much transmission in most of the state. But diagnostics at this time were really hard to come by. Um, it was really, and when you were able to get a diagnostic test, the results could take weeks, right? And most people couldn't even get a test. So we didn't really know what was going on at the local level early in the pandemic. And so we just shut everything down. So here we're looking at all the different wastewater treatment plants throughout New York State, right? So wastewater surveillance, we could have tested the entire population using wastewater. We could say with more certainty where the virus was or was not in different communities. And so 
what kind of information, what would you have done if you had this kind of information, right? Knew what was going on in your wastewater, knew what was going on in the community. And so we did have a pilot program last summer in a few sewer sheds in upstate New York to see if we could kind of correlate what's going on in the wastewater with what was going on um, in the cases. So here are our results. And so the orange color, right, are places which had a lot of transmission, the blue cases, the bluish color, right, didn't have very much transmission. And so we see a different in the a difference in the distributions in cases that have a lot of transmission versus no transmission and being able to detect the virus in the wastewater. And so with multi if you're regularly testing the wastewater, if you have multiple samples in a row with non-detections, then you can be much more certain that there is no transmission in your community, uh, independent of diagnostic testability, health-seeking behavior um, of each individual. So what would be the costs of a statewide wastewater surveillance program, right? So how much would you pay to know that your area is free of transmission or has really low transmission, right? Um, what would you have paid to be able to know that you could send your kids or your grandkids to school or that you could have hugged your grandkids, right, last summer when we knew with more certainty at the local level what was going on because of this wastewater? Um, and so we actually did, went through and came up with a cost Right, so it costs about $350 a sample um, to analyze the wastewater. And so that would be about $50,000 for a single wastewater treatment plant to test their samples twice a week all year. So that would be about 23 million for twice weekly testing at all 632 municipal wastewater treatment plants in New York State, right? Which seems like a lot of money, $23 million. But what that works out to is an additional dollar and 20 state, 20 cents on your taxes per New York state resident a year for twice weekly testing at every single municipal wastewater plant. All right, so that's 0.35% of the CARES Act and about 3% of the lost sales tax revenue from these huge statewide lockdowns. And so if we have a regular wastewater surveillance program, we could do, use it for SARS. We could use it for the next new pandemic threat. You can also use it to monitor for different uh, drug use. So illicit drugs, as well as prescription drugs to see what the health of the community is like. And so if we had had a program like this in place before the pandemic, we could have easily tested the wastewater, tested the entire community with one test twice a week and known with much more certainty at the local level what's happening. And then we can target the interventions, right? Keep schools open in some areas, close schools in other areas. So we could have targeted local interventions to control the spread of disease. And so then finally, one question I get asked a lot is, will a pandem pandemic happen again? Um, and yes, Definitely, it's not if, but it's when for me. Um, and that's because you know we have climate change, um, which moves habitats. Move animals have to change their habitats as things become less um, or you know more hostile for them. We have deforestation and habitat destruction, which causes humans to come into contact with animals and insects that we don't usually come in contact with, or other animals to come into contact with other animals that they don't come into contact with. Um, and so the, those things combined will definitely cause another pandemic at some point as, the, as animals and insects and humans come into contact with things that they haven't before. And so we're a global community, you can get around the world in less than a day. And so even though risk is local and all about at the community level, we are a global and connected world. And so what happens around the world will matter for us. And so that's all I have prepared to present. And so I would love to open it up for questions. And so thank you all for listening.